Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Goldstein. I am the director of the TAM Institute for Jewish Studies at Emory University. And it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to the annual Rabbi Jacob Rothschild Memorial Lecture. Uh, the Rothschild Lecture uh, was established in 2007 to honor Rabbi Jacob M. Rothschild, who was the spiritual leader of Atlanta's Hebrew Benevolent Congregation. Uh, known as the Temple, and he was a voice for social change in Atlanta and throughout the South. Uh, each year, a guest scholar memorializes Rabbi Rothschild with a lecture on a topic relevant to his life and work, such as Jewish ethics, Jewish social movements, modern Judaism, or Southern Jewish history. And uh, I'm very honored to have with us uh, this evening uh, Eric K. Ward, who is the executive director of the Western, uh, sorry, the the ex, uh, the exec, the executive director of the Western States Center, uh, and uh, originally uh, we had a, a different plan for the Rothschild lecture uh, earlier in the year. And when the events of this year, uh, the, the, the outbreaks of racial violence that we've seen in many of our cities uh, and all of the traumatic events uh, that we've witnessed over the last many months occurred, uh, I felt that we really needed to change course and to um, examine some of these issues through the vehicle of the Rothschild lecture. Rabbi Rothschild was uh, a, a proponent of civil rights in Atlanta and I felt that the Rothschild Lecture would be a, an excellent vehicle um, to examine some of these issues that are so relevant to us today. So uh, for that reason, uh, it was my pleasure to be able to invite Eric Ward. Uh, before I uh, go ahead and, and um, introduce Eric, um, I wanna tell you um, a little bit about uh, the program. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the co-sponsors of this event, the Fox Center for Humanistic Inquiry, the Hightower Fund, the Department of Religion, the Center for Ethics, the Office of Spiritual and Religious Life, and the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Uh, and I also want to give a special thanks to our communications coordinator, Danielle Patron, uh, and our executive director at the TAM Institute, Paul Entis, uh, for really helping to make this program possible. Um, also, before uh, we start the, the program in earnest, I want to take this opportunity to let you know that this is one of several uh, lectures that we'll be offering via Zoom this, this semester and next semester. Um, the, the next program that's coming up, which I encourage you to attend, is uh, the Goldwasser Lecture in Jewish Studies and the Arts, which will take place on Monday, November 16th at 7.30 p.m. And our guest lecture will be Professor Tony Michaels of the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And he will be speaking on uh, a topic related to Yiddish culture. It's on the, uh, the history of Yiddish magazines in America. And to register for this and, and uh, any other program uh, sponsored by the TAM Institute, you can visit js.emory.edu. OK. Um, it's really a uh, pleasure to introduce Eric Ward, um, not only for the reasons that I've already mentioned, uh, but also because, uh, because of my own work in the area of uh, issues around race and Jewish identity. Um, I, my first book was called The Price of Whiteness, Jews, Race, and American Identity. And so these are issues very close to my heart and things that I think about a lot. And so I um, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be able to be in conversation with Eric Ward. Um, I first um, learned about Eric's work uh, a few years ago after the events in Charlottesville uh, that uh, happened in the wake of the Unite the Right rally in 2017. And it was a very interesting moment, um, both in US history and, and in the history of um, the struggle for racial justice and also uh, in American Jewish history. And one of the very interesting things was that at an event that, that ostensibly started uh, uh, as a protest and, a, and, a, and a, a disagreement over Confederate memorials, 
um, and where the, uh, white racism against African-Americans was on display, that in the middle of this event also uh, the, the, the rally attendees marched through holding torches and, and stating Jews will not replace us. And I think for many American Jews, that was a kind of uh, interesting and, and scary time, but it also raised the question, uh, what is the connection between these events? How does anti-Semitism fit in with this larger story of white nationalism in America? And Eric wrote a very interesting article um, which I read at that time and I've returned to many times since then. And it was called Skin in the Game, How um, Anti-Semitism Animates White Nationalism. And so um, tonight's, uh, tonight we'll talk a little bit about that article, but also we'll use it as a jumping off point to discuss some other issues and, and things that have emerged uh, since Charlottesville. Um, but, um, you know, I just wanted to mention that before I give the introduction to, to say that this was a, a, a very significant piece and one that uh, really got me thinking more about the connections between contemporary events around white nationalism and whiteness and uh, the place that the Jewish community uh, has in, in these discussions. Um, Eric Ward is a nationally recognized expert on the relationship between authoritarian movements, hate violence, and preserving inclusive democracy. And he brings over 30 years of leadership in community organizing and philanthropy to his roles as Western State Center's executive director and senior fellow with the Southern Poverty Law Center and Race Forward. Since Eric took the helm in, in 2017, the Western State Center has become a national hub for innovative responses to white nationalism, anti-Semitism, and structural inequality. In his more than 30 year career uh, in civil rights, Eric has worked with community groups, government and business leaders, human rights advocates, and philanthropy as an organizer, director, program officer, consultant and board member. And currently the co-chair for the Proteus Fund, Eric is a member of the Pop Culture Collaborative's Pluralist Visionaries Program, and also the recipient of a Peabody Facebook Futures Media Award. He is a frequent public speaker and media source, and he's also the author of multiple written works that have been cited uh, with key narrative shifts. And one of them is the article that I mentioned called Skin in the Game, How Anti-Semitism Animates White Nationalism, which uh, I encourage you to go online and, and read it. Uh, uh, it's, it's widely available. Eric is working on a forthcoming documentary about whiteness and race in America. And uh, also he is an aspiring singer songwriter under the name of Bulldog Shadow. Uh, we definitely need to ask about that in the question and answer period. <laughs> So the way that it's, the, this is kind of a, um, a two-man show tonight, um, I am going to serve as a kind of, of interviewer and, and interlocutor with Eric. I will pose some, some questions that will um, give him a chance to explore some of the different issues uh, around this issue of Jews and uh, whiteness and the fight for racial equality in America. Uh, some of it may be conversational, uh, we will carry that on um, for about 35 or 40 minutes, um, and then we will shift to uh, fielding questions from the audience. And so um, I see someone has already taken advantage of the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. Uh, please do that. You can, you can put the questions in there as we're talking so you don't forget them, uh, but we will not be answering those questions until we finish our segment, and then we'll switch to the audience questions. Um, and I will read the audience questions uh, for Eric. So let me start. Um, Eric, I wanted to, as I said in the introduction, I became aware of your work in 2017 when you wrote the article called Skin in the Game about anti-Semitism and white nationalism. And I'd like you to maybe tell us a little bit about how did you come to write that article um, and how, what was the kind of journey which led you to become sensitive to the intersection of anti-Semitism and white nationalism. And maybe you can tell us, you know, what, what are the insights? What was the thesis um, 
uh, of your article. And I'm interested particularly in both, you know, you talk kind of about the overlap or the intersection of anti-Semitism and white nationalism, but also how are they distinct phenomena? That sounds like a great question. And Eric, it's, it's, um, it's good to see you. Uh, when I got the invite, I was like, well, I don't know who should be interviewing who uh, in terms of, of tonight, but it is uh, wonderful to, to sit with you and just uh, ever grateful for, for your work. Um, I hope everyone has uh, read um, The Price of Whiteness. It, it is a profound look at uh, uh, race and uh, whiteness and its fluidity in America, which we will be talking about because you can't talk about anti-Semitism uh, in America without talking about whiteness and, and its fluid nature. Uh, but to get directly to your question, um, you know, my journey actually starts, uh, I won't go through the whole story, but, you know, it starts in Southern California in uh, the uh, mid seventies, uh, when I moved to Long Beach, California. And I moved to Long Beach, California in the mid seventies in sixth grade in the midst of the desegregation of the public schools by the Long Beach, California Unified School District. And um, that meant that I was sent to another school on a city bus where I then had to walk uh, a few blocks uh, to the school. And for most of seventh, eighth and ninth grade, um, that bus trip and getting to and from school meant daily harassment from folks who drove by, uh, uh, you know, screaming racist things, throwing things from cars, revving their engines, throwing out threats. Uh, it happened to me and so many other students um, who were going back and forth, who were part of the busing program uh, to largely white schools that it quickly became normalized for us. We, we didn't know it was a, a bad thing. It's just what it meant to go to school. And it happened so much. It, it's interesting that none of us, not once ever thought about telling our parents, right? Or telling a teacher. We just quickly normalized what was happening around us and, and how we experienced it. That, that went on until, um, until high school. And in, in high school, it became a different environment. And I'm not quite sure why, uh, but by the time I hit high school, we are at the origins of both uh, hip hop, right? Punk, right? And the rise of, of what then is known as, as heavy metal. And for many of us, um, we were in this moment in time, really where our parents weren't watching us, right? Um, they didn't know what desegregation meant. We didn't know what it meant. The institutions didn't know what it was meant. Uh, they just threw us all together in this space. And as kids in high school, you quickly want to find an identity. And music became that identity. And that music became very value laden for many of us who were crossing genres. And um, I grew up in, in the punk, ska, and reggae subcultures of Southern California. Uh, those were subcultures that were contested spaces um, between white power punks, neo-Nazi skinheads on one side, right, and punk rockers and, and artists and anti-racist skinheads uh, on the other. Those were known uh, as the invisible wars that raged on the West Coast, uh, but that was my growing up experience as, as just a, a poor uh, working class, uh, uh, single family, uh, kid trying to make it. I moved up to Eugene, Oregon in 1986. And right before I moved up was another individual. His name was Richard Butler. And he, uh, like me, also uh, grew up in, in Southern California. Unlike me, he was white and he was also a pastor. And he moved his church um, up to Hayden Lake, Idaho, and renamed it the Church of Jesus Christ Christian Aryan Nations. And the Aryan Nations taught three things. The first was that Jews were the literal children of Satan, people of color were subhuman, and white Northern Europeans were the true descendants of the lost tribes of Israel. The Aryan Nations had a plan, and its plan was called the Northwest Imperative. And the Northwest Imperative sought to take uh, the Western Pacific Northwest states 
and carve it into what they called an Aryan homeland, free of Jews and, and people of color. Uh, many of us began organizing, right, in the music community. Uh, you know, we often say that the coalitions here that were built were so diverse that you could find a conservative Republican farmer sitting across the table from a blue haired Mohawk punk rocker. We didn't have much in common when it came to politics and growing up, but we knew that this form of bigotry wasn't the answer to the problems and we banded together. As we were doing research and I have to say, Eric, it was pre-internet, right? This is, you couldn't go to the internet and research these groups. One of the ways that they would announce themselves is through flyers and, and the spreading of propaganda um, or hate crimes. And we would collect these flyers because they would tell us a lot about who the organization was, who might be running it, how serious were they in terms of, of a threat to rural and urban communities in our region. One of the things that I began to notice uh, in groupings with others as they were researching this is that every flyer was vilely racist or homophobic or uh, anti-Muslim or anti-Latino, you, you name it, and those, those flyers were. I don't use those flyers, right? I still actually have many of those flyers. I don't use them because they're, they're vile white nationalist propaganda, and I don't want to do their work for them. But I began to notice something, that all the flyers, no matter how racist or Islamophobic or homophobic um, or, or anti-Latino that they might be or anti-immigrant, they always had some reference to the Jewish community. And it was usually in the form of a caricature, either someone holding like puppet strings or a distorted star of David, right? Or references such as the Zionist occupational government or the international Jewish banking conspiracy. It was nearly on every flyer we collected. And so for me, I became curious. I, I didn't come to understand or, or begin thinking about anti-Semitism because I thought, oh, we need to have kind of this broad based understanding of bigotry. I wish, right? It was really curiosity. Here was this movement that was threatening uh, people's lives, right? It was threatening advancement towards civil rights and equality in our region. And they seemed to be fixated on the Jews. And I thought as an organizer, if I wanted to understand how we managed uh, and, and came to terms with this white nationalist movement, that I needed to understand what was driving it. And it seemed to be this thing called anti-Semitism. And that's how I came to start trying to learn more about anti-Semitism. Luckily, I had you know, really smart folks around me, many of them out of the South at the time, right? Uh, um, Daniel Levitas, you know, Loretta Ross, C.T. Vivian, uh, uh, Leonard Zeskin out of the Midwest, um, and, and many others who had done a lot of work, Suzanne Farr out of Arkansas, um, and others. But I came to, to begin to reflect on that issue, and I'll, I'm going to end this question. Uh, this was a long answer, but I think it's the important one. By coming to some beliefs around anti-Semitism in the United States and how it's used by the white nationalist movement uh, and how we have fallen short. And that is that as we stand in this moment, talking tonight, right, um, with Emory, right, the Rothschild lecture, which honors Jacob Rothschild uh, and, you know, who was targeted, right? And his community, the Jewish community targeted through the temple bombing in 1958. I reflect that we just two days ago are remembering those who were killed at the Tree of Life synagogue in Pittsburgh. And not much has changed in terms of anti-Semitism between 1958 uh, and 2020, except its veracity and uh, the fact that it has moved um, uh, as a racialized form of bigotry from the margins to the mainstream. So this is what I tell people. This is the core component of Skin in the Game, the essay that I authored about four months before Charlottesville, that anti-Semitism isn't at the core of white nationalism. It is the core of white nationalism. 
and that it is so central to the growth of this white nationalist movement that black people and other marginalized groups will not win our freedom if we are not off we are, if we are not also in the active in the struggle to uproot this form of anti-Semitism that is uh, uh, moving across America. And that in this form of anti-Semitism, uh, white nationalists have cast Jews in the same role that they have filled, have always filled for anti-Semites as the absolute other, as demons stirring the pot of lesser evils and the driving force behind white dispossession. And at the foundation of modern day, of this modern day movement, right, is the explicit claim that Jews are a separate race and that their ostensible position having white skin is the greatest trick that the devil has ever played, according to white nationalists. And despite and indeed because of the whiteness of, of a portion of, of, of the Jewish community as Jewish people, they are seen as an enemy race that has infiltrated whiteness and must be exposed and, and eliminated. This fantasy of Jewish power, in my opinion, explains uh, for the white nationalist movement how Black Americans, a, a race they see as supposed inferiors, could have orchestrated the end of Jim Crow, how feminist and LGBTQ people have upended traditional gender roles, and how workers uh, are mounting a challenge to, to global capitalism and the inequality and in wealth. When folks ask me, where is the anti-Semitism in the white nationalist movement? It's everywhere, right? When the tree of life shooter says, Jews were committing a genocide against white people, he was using a language that was intimately familiar, right? To fellow white nationalists. Such rabid anti-Semitism is the framework in which the entire white nationalist movement functions. And at the end of the day, that understanding led me to believe that to refuse to deal with any ideology of domination, which anti-Semitism is, right, is to abet it. And that fighting anti-Semitism cuts off the animating force of white nationalism for the sake of all marginalized communities. Now, I'll leave it with one question or, or, or one thought. I just talked about white nationalism. And I also argue in this piece that white nationalism is something related but distinct from white supremacy, right? The system of oppression that we as people of color and others, women, right? Indigenous people have experienced uh, for nearly 500 years uh, here uh, on, on this land. And so my final argument was that we needed to understand and separate white supremacy from white nationalism. And that conflating the two was the equivalent of conflating a Big Mac and a cow because they are both made out of beef, right? And that uh, at the end of the day, when we drop our Big Mac or a filet of fish on the uh, ground, we don't call a veterinarian and that the tools we need to respond to white supremacy, tools that we have constructed and continue to build are not sufficient, right? In addressing white nationalism, which is a social movement, not a system. Thank you. And, and I, again, I really encourage everybody to read Skin in the Game online. Um, so I wanna move, I wanna, use that as a jumping off point to think about some more recent events. And, you know, when we, when we think about it, first of all, I didn't realize that you, you wrote that months before Charlottesville, which really shows how prescient you were in terms of, you know, putting your finger on something, which then came into such, uh, you know, was so visible in those events. But when we think about those events, um, we're very focused on the dangers posed by white nationalists and other extremist elements in our society uh, that seem to have found encouragement in this particular political moment in our society. But, but over this past summer with the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and, and others, um, the discussion has now focused somewhat away from extremists and, and the types of folks who demonstrated in Charlottesville 
And they've turned more to talking about the systemic nature of racism, uh, how racism is not just something uh, conveyed by, by people holding torches in a rally, but that it's something that is embedded in the everyday life and, and culture uh, of our society. And so what's come out of this more recent phase of this movement is uh, you know, people being encouraged to think more about things like white privilege um, and, and, and unconscious bias and things like that. Um, and I wanna say that I, I, my sense is that um, that is a, a, a difficult um, topic to confront in some ways for many American Jews uh, and particularly Jews of European uh, background because Jew, those Jews in, in, the United, in US history have had a kind of dual identity. They, on the one hand, they are, um, they are a group who, whose ancestors, sometimes even themselves, but, but certainly their ancestors have been persecuted and they, they very much identify as, a, as an outsider group. Um, and, and feel vulnerable in many ways to anti-Semitism. And yet uh, at the same time, the story of American Jews has been one of um, amazing integration and success and, and incorporation into um, the dominant white society of the United States. Um, and so there's this kind of duality of being both insiders and outsiders. And so I think it's very hard sometimes uh, for, for many people in the Jewish community to kind of get their minds around the ways in which ideas about white privilege may apply to them. And so I'm curious, how, what is your thinking about how can we square these things? How can we, on the one hand, reflect on the work that, that Jews along with other uh, white individuals in the United States have to do some work in terms of addressing and thinking about issues of white privilege, but at the same time to, to do that in a way that kind of recognizes the way in which many Jews feel vulnerable precisely because of Charlottesville and Pittsburgh and Poway and all of these events, um, you know, of our recent history. Yeah, um, this, is, this is so good. I think, you know, what I reflect on uh, is, is this, I, I reflect on my own life, right? Um, I mean, I was, a, you know, when I was a young kid, when I was a young kid, th in my neighborhood in Long Beach, uh, there was a young man by the name of Ron Settles. And, and Ron Settles uh, was a phenomenal uh, football player, was uh, well-known in my neighborhood, he was older than me. He was older than me probably by, you know, 12 years. And uh, he was like our community uh, hero. And um, one night, Ron Settles um, uh, was stopped by police at the foot of Signal Hill, which was an enclave surrounded by Long Beach. And uh, he was arrested uh, that night. Uh, and he was put in a jail cell. And the next morning he was found uh, hanging from his cell uh, and uh, had his hands tied behind his back, right? Uh, the police called it suicide. Um, we called it murder. Now, today we understand that it wasn't a murder, right? Uh, uh, murders are against the law. Uh, it was a police killing, and uh, the police killing of Black people is mostly uh, sanctioned by law, right? It's not just that juries don't convict people. It is that the laws we have designed around policing protect law enforcement officers uh, in their disproportionate violence uh, against Black people, including unarmed uh, uh, Black people. It's not the only police uh, brutality, right? I was chased by the police when I was at the age of seven, right? By the time um, I was 21, right? I had a police officer who put a gun to my head, right? And said that he could pull the trigger and no one would care, right? I was a program officer for the Ford Foundation, 
overseeing its civil rights portfolio and was physically attacked on my way, right, to work in Grand Central Union, right, by an undercover police officer, right, while wearing a suit. So I, I say this um, with pure directness. I understand the anger um, around police brutality and um, continuing racial inequality in America uh, that, you know, uh, 75 years after the civil rights movement, uh, that white supremacy still remains with us as, as a de facto reality that is often backed up by outdated law that was for another time in this nation, uh, 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 a time that we should, we should not look back on uh, uh, with fondness, but uh, only in the fondness of those who, who resisted against it, uh, like uh, Rabbi Rothschild, for instance. So I, I just say this because I think it's important to acknowledge the anger uh, that we all feel. And George, the murder of George Floyd uh, was significant for those of us in the Black community and all those who, are, um, who stand against racial injustice because it showed the sheer tenacity of racism, right? And how much energy goes into, into racism. And Eric, I promise I'm gonna come back and answer this question, but I feel like this is a really good piece here, which is this, right? There is a police officer who leaned on the neck of an unarmed person, right? For eight minutes and 46 seconds, right? For eight minutes and 46 seconds, he put pressure on the back of a person's neck while that person was pleading for their life. Not once did he release pressure. Not once did he feel like he should re um, release that pressure. In addition, there were other law enforcement officers who stood by. Not one of them intervened in that eight minutes and 46 seconds watching what was transpiring. There were folks who were standing around watching, many who took videos. Not one of them intervened. And you think about how much energy that took, right? How much focus that took. And that tells us how deep racism lies within our society, right? And I think about this, this all the time because I'm often asked, why should we worry about these, these white nationalists, right? Uh, they aren't the cause of most deaths of black, indigenous, and other people of color uh, in the United States, right? Infant mortality rates, mass incarceration, the economic inequality, right? The spatial segregation that many of our communities have to face each and every day takes our lives all the time, right? To make that a real example, currently in the United States, right? One out of 900, out of every 920 Black people has now died from COVID-19. And I'll say that again, one out of every 920 Black Americans, right, has lost their lives in the last eight months to COVID-19. That is significant. The, the, the death rate is much higher than anything white nationalists have done so why should we care? I think we should care. Uh, any of us who believe that our social movements have impact on a society should care about other social movements. And we should not be arrogant in the sense that we think that we are the only social movements with agency and effect on a society. Not all social movements are grounded in inclusion. There are social movements that are grounded in exclusion. And the white nationalist movement is one of those. It's not just white supremacy. In many ways, it is a rejection of white supremacy. White nationalists, just like the racial justice and civil rights movement, sees white supremacy as a failed system. Despite the, the, the rhetoric of make America great again, right? the white nationalist movement in America is not seeking to take us back right? to the, and this is crass, but to the bygone day eras of gone with the wind. That is not their goal. They are a revolutionary movement that seeks to overthrow the US government. It believes the US government has been taken over 
by a Jewish conspiracy. And anti-Semitism is an effective conspiracy theory that dehumanizes all of us. The very nature, right, of social movements means that they will have impact on our society. I used to tell a joke and um, the joke was about CNN. Uh, I grew up watching CNN. I'm gonna make a lot of pop culture references tonight, but grew up watching CNN. Remember when CNN first came on the air, when it first came on the air, right? Uh, they didn't have much to fill that 24 hour cycle. And so they did a lot of repeating of, of news pieces over and over again. Well, maybe that much hasn't changed, but you know what I mean. It's gotten much more sophisticated. One of the things they used to do was a thing called the Fashion Minute. And they would go to London or Tokyo or New York, Paris, and they'd show off like the latest fashions. I hated that Fashion Minute. I mean, I used to love to sit there and watch those fashions and say, oh my God, I hate that. No one's going to wear that. And I'm right, like most of those fashions are never gonna be worn, right? They're worn to the Oscars or to the White House once or to an auction and you never see them again. But I began to notice something that those fashions, right? That I was seeing come down the runway that I thought were so extreme, so way out there, right? Were starting to be sold on the clothing racks three to five years later. Uh, my argument is just simply this, why should we care about this social movement? We should care. Because um, just like fashion, right, the white nationalist movement seeks to influence what happens, right, in the political, social, and cultural mainstream of America. And just like fashion, it has been just as successful. It is why the fight to dismantle white supremacy, that system, right, not the white nationalism, the social movement, but that white supremacy, the system, it's why many of our battles have shifted, right? From what type of exploitation does the society want us to live under to criminalization and removal. That criminalization and removal narrative is a white nationalist narrative. It shows that the white nationalist movement is beginning to have influences in our society. So much influence that it was part of the winning coalition uh, for the sitting president of the United States. Uh, we should care because unless we are arrogant, we have to acknowledge that social movements that are not our own still have impact in our society, can still shape narrative and can shape outcomes. But it's not only that, it's also because we have to get out of this false binary, right? That we have in social movements, that it is us against the man or us against the state, right? That it's us against power. That is a very limited way of understanding both global political dynamics, right, and national dynamics. It is not simply us against the man. There are other social movements uh, on the terrain of America, and they too are also contending for who will provide the governance for a 21st century America. And so we ignore them, uh, we downplay them uh, to our own detriment. Instead, we need to build diverse movements and diverse thinking that understands that this is not a hierarchy, right? This is not a choice. If we are to be serious leaders in the 21st century civil rights movement, if we are to be serious activists, if we are to be serious researchers, writers, and academics, it means we have to contend with the fact that we must address right, inequalities that, uh, that exist because of white supremacy and racial inequality. And we also have to contend with a white nationalist movement at the same time. They're just simply not the same thing. And, and in terms of whiteness and, and, and Jews, I'll just say this. Um, we should keep in mind that, uh, Eric, you and I have talked about this before, when we throw out the word whiteness, it's important to think about what historical context are we talking about whiteness in. Whiteness is fluid, right? And it has always been fluid in our society. You will find instances where Mexicans in the Southwest were considered white as part of the Treaty of Guadalupe for a period. I can guarantee you, if you are Mexican in the Southwest, it's rare that you are seen as white today. Um, I also make the case that up until September 11th, 
if you were light-skinned Arab American uh, in the United States, you were considered white visually, not just on the census, but visually. I can guarantee for folks that after September 11th, after September 11th attacks in New York uh, and uh, in DC, um, that that was no longer the case, right? That folks would primarily, you're white, for, for Arab Americans, whiteness became temporary, right? It became not as important, not an afforded form of protection uh, when folks realized that they were Arab American. And I would argue for Jews in America, whiteness has also been uh, a, a fluid piece and, um, and limited. Most white people don't have to spend time wondering if they are white in America. That is one of the privileges of whiteness. People don't question you uh, in American society. Jews have their whiteness question because there's something else on the mind of America, right? That is more important than white skin when it comes to Jews. And it is their Jewishness. And that is where anti-Semitism lies in America. And I will just say this, we should understand this about anti-Semitism and all other forms of bigotry. White nationalists don't bring those forms of bigotry into our communities, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, racism, sexism, um, homophobia, right, transphobia. They simply organize the bigotry that already exists. If the white nationalist movement is choosing to tap into anti-Semitism, it is because they believe that anti-Semitism can be used to organize power. And that puts it alongside every other form of bigotry in America. Thank you. So I want to put a little sharper point on this in terms of, I want to give you a couple of scenarios that one sometimes hears in the Jewish community. And I'm sure it won't surprise you that, that like all communities, yes. th there are differences of opinions and, and debates and, and disagreements among American Jews about issues around things like race and white privilege. Um, in, in recent months, for example, in many of the protests that have happened around the country, you could see a visible Jewish presence of people protesting with some sign or something where they wanted to call out the fact that they were, were protesting as Jews. But at the same time, there are some in the Jewish community who have uh, kind of distanced themselves from the protest, um, specifically because they feel that Black Lives Matter as a movement um, has articulated an anti-Israel um, and some would argue, some of them would argue anti-Semitic viewpoint in their advocacy for the Palestinian cause. And I'm wondering, um, as someone who is involved in coalition building, you know, what would you say to, to someone with that viewpoint? How, how would you respond to that person's reluctance to get involved or to be actively identified with the protests? Yeah. So I'm a believer in the right to, uh, to free association. Um, so I um, honor anyone's choice. But, but what I would say, what I would reflect on is I, I think folks are, are missing a critical moment in, in history and um, are missing uh, a really powerful conversation that is underway. And that conversation doesn't happen um, unless you are in the mix, right? So choosing not to participate, right, is choosing to remove yourself from the 21st century civil rights movement. And um, I, I think um, that's really important for folks to consider when they're thinking about this. And, and when I say the 21st century civil rights movement, what I mean specifically is that right now um, uh, we have witnessed uh, the largest civil rights demonstrations over the last eight months that have ever taken place in the United States. And I believe that is both by um, uh, uh, percentage of population, right? And by whole number, right? It is significant. How significant is it? Well, let's put it this way. More Americans today, including white Americans, right? Support Black Lives Matter, right? As a uh, social movement than ever supported Martin Luther King Jr. in his lifetime. We forget 
now that we are um, 75 years away uh, from the civil rights, I mean, 60 to 75 years, but I think it's important to remember at no point in his lifetime did Martin Luther King Jr. receive the majority of white support in America, right? No time in his lifetime. No time in uh, the lifetime of, of, of uh, the SNCC nonviolent protests, right? The sit in, the nonviolent sit ins, right? The, the bus desegregation actions, uh, the voting campaigns, right? At no point did SNCC receive the majority of white support uh, in the United States. In fact, Black Lives Matters today receives more support from white America today than the civil rights movement did. That is really, really significant. And it is a sign of progress. It is a sign of how far the 1960s civil rights movement has brought us, right? That all of that sacrifice Right? All of that hard coalition building uh, has brought us to this point, and it seems like a moral, uh, a moral shame. Um, I'm sad uh, for anyone in the United States today who misses the opportunity uh, to help forge and be part of that movement, because it is your home, right? It is your home regardless of, of, of who you are. So here's where I think Here's where the controversy, I think, resides. I think it is hard for us to hold in the United States that we can both be the victims of one form of bigotry, right, and perpetrators of another form of bigotry at the same time, right? I can be on the receiving end of racism and still express or act in ways that are sexist or homophobic or anti-Semitic. One can be on the receiving end of anti-Semitism, right? And respond in ways that actually um, are part racist, right? Not the person, uh, but the incident. So let me give an example of this because I, I want to really complicate this. I'm actually not going to answer this question. I'm just going to make it super complicated, <laughs> right? Um, and, it's, and it's this. Um, we all remember Deshaun Jackson. Uh, black football player uh, who uh, utilized some vile anti-Semitic uh, rhetoric, right? That was clearly not just a, a slur that was made out of, um, you know, out of uh, not understanding something, right? It was part of an ideology that got expressed. And Deshaun Jackson got a lot of heat, right? Uh, Deshaun Jackson got beat up on social media, right? Uh, other players took him to task. Other folks in the sports world uh, took him to task. Those of us in the civil rights movement, including African American leaders, uh, took them to you know took him to task. Folks often say they don't, you know, uh, folks who aren't black say they didn't see black folks taking you know leaders taking them to task. My response is you actually wouldn't know because we live in a segregated society. You do not follow the folks. I, I guarantee you, most of you do not follow the folks I follow on social media, right? That, that's not our fault. That's a society that is just segregated along lines of race and religion and class. Uh, but there was the most condemnation of anyone I've ever seen uh, who has expressed something anti-Semitic in our society. I'm not saying that's, a, I'm going to withhold judgment on that for a second. I'm not saying it's a good or bad thing. I'm just recognizing that. That same week, right, Madonna and Chelsea Handler both uh, said things that were also deeply anti-Semitic, right? I can guarantee you they did not get any of the heat that Deshaun Jackson, like barely any of the same heat that Deshaun Jackson got. Uh, why is that? Why is it that Deshaun Jackson was held and other African-Americans who made you know, other comments during that time period, why were they held to a different standard, right? Than uh, Madonna, who has way more fans, Chelsea Handler, who has way more fans than Deshaun Jackson. I'm not saying he's irrelevant, I'm just pointing that out. Uh, uh, in fact, I think during that month, uh, the President of the United States said something deeply anti-Semitic. He did not get held to the same account. So that leads me to believe that 
even as we are challenging anti-Semitism, we have to be cautious that we're not also expressing racism, right? Uh, there is something in this society, right, that socializes us to see Black people as more threatening, right, and uh, more dangerous in our society. And I believe those same, um, uh, those same feelings sometimes uh, guide how we respond to anti-Semitic incidences, and we reinforce racial inequality when we do that. So I have some tips on this. The first is, is that if we're gonna actually take folks to task, we gotta take everyone to task, right? In the same manner, with the same energy. So I'm not here tonight to say, be nicer to Deshaun Jackson, right? Um, though I would make another argument for why I think that's important, but I'm not gonna say that tonight. What I'm gonna say is Deshaun Jackson said something that was vile and anti-Semitic. And folks in the Jewish community and outside the Jewish community have the right to hold him accountable. But what you don't have the right to do is to hold him to a different standard because he's black, right? That is an expression of, of, of racism in our society. That does not help us solve the problem. Uh, in fact, it creates more divides rather than solving the issue. I would also say that around Black Lives Matter, right? Um, I belong to lots of organizations. I'll, I'll name some of them right now, right? The, the Sierra Club uh, uh, is one of them. I belong to the Nashville Songwriters Association uh, is, is another example. Um, I belong to, to lots of things. Um, I can tell you right now, right? I do not agree with every policy and every position, right? That these organizations uh, take, right? Whoever I vote for at election time, I can guarantee you, I do not agree with 100% you know, of everything they do, right, and say. And sometimes folks say things that deeply up, um, upset me. I don't walk away from those organizations uh, because of that. Why? Because it's not the organization's stance, right? It's an expression of bigotry that occurred, right? Or a fight over a specific, you know, uh, something that was bigoted, right? There is a difference. So I just want to say this. There is a difference between the white nationalist movement who has anti-Semitism as its core, right? Not a, an accidental expression of it. It is the driving force, right? There is something different about that than Black Lives Matters, which isn't even an entity, right? It's a broad movement of individuals like myself and others, um, Across the, across the country, organizations, sometimes you know, organizations of three people, sometimes organizations of 100 people. There's not like a headquarters you can go to, right, and meet with the head of Black Lives Matter. It's a, it's a network, right? And um, it does not have, have anti-Semitism as core to its ideology. But like just the rest of society, it can and will sometimes express anti-Semitism. And we have to address that and deal with that. But you can't do that if you're outside of a movement. You don't have influence, right? You don't have agency. Um, and I think we have to reject purity uh, politics. And I'll just say this, Eric, because I know we have to get to questions. But imagine for a second, imagine for a second, that I refused to participate in anything, right? In this society that was racist, right? That I refused to engage in any organization that has ever you know, committed an act of racism or done something that was in detriment to, to the black community. I bet I wouldn't be speaking to, to universities around this country. I bet I wouldn't be speaking to, to media I bet there are a lot of uh, places of worship that I would uh, never attend. There are folks I would never sit down with. Uh, that's a purity politic. And uh, we have to beware that kind of purity politic. There are certainly moral lines. It is true, right, that non-Jews, including non-Jews of color, right, have far to go in addressing anti-Semitism. We don't get there by throwing out ultimatums, right? That we will not participate. We will not sit with folks. 
That's not how we move forward together. It's, it's not what leadership leads in this moment. We need folks who understand the importance of the common good in America and aren't afraid to step out there in spaces in order to bring us together and achieve it. Thank you. Um, I, I have a couple of more questions, but in the interest of time, I wanna move to the audience questions because I'm pretty sure that, that some of the audience members will ask some of the same things I would have asked you. So I think it's great to throw it open to, to discussion. So I'm looking at some of the questions here. Um, one question is, um, do other black activists agree with your premise that anti-Semitism is at the core of white nationalism? Have you gotten feedback, either positive or negative, on this idea from, from other activists and other people who are thinking about white nationalism? Yeah, um, not from anyone who has actually sat down and studied the white nationalist movement, right? I, I think we have our own stereotypes, right? We have our own conventional wisdoms around how the world works, right? When I first moved up from, um, from Long Beach, California to Oregon, I had all kinds of stereotypes. I remember asking my friends, right? If, uh, uh, if Eugene, Oregon had like running water, right? Was there electricity? Was there McDonald's? Was there MTV, right? Was there cable TV? And I, I wasn't saying those things because I was being um, um, uh, uh, trying to be mean um, or um, uh, trying to poke fun, right? Those were real questions I had. I just never had gone to um, Oregon before, right? So I didn't, didn't know. I had never left Southern California except to go to uh, Chicago. And so um, I just had no idea what Oregon looked like. So it looked in my head, right? If you could have looked at it, you would have seen San Francisco, a bunch of trees and the Space Needle. And so for folks who are listening should know the Space Needle isn't even in Oregon, right? It's in Seattle, Washington. <laughs> what I was thinking in my head looked much more akin to like Little House in the Prairie in what, like 18, what's that? 1870, 1860, right? America. It, my head was full of stereotypes and that's what our brains do, right? Our brains categorize, they sort. And when we don't have information, we fill in those blanks with things we think we know. And we in the racial justice movement, right? We think we know a lot of things about another social movement that we've actually never taken the time uh, to study, right? I attended white nationalist meetings um, from 1991 until 2001. Right, I sat with white nationalist leaders. Um, I helped neo-Nazis leave movements. Right, I was with paramilitary leaders. I read their material. I wrote about them. Uh, and anyone who has taken the time to actually read white nationalist theorists like William Pierce, Tom Metzger, David Duke uh, cannot walk away and say, anti-Semitism is not the core to white nationalism. You can say it, um, but it is not academically true, right? Uh, and it is not true uh, even from just listening and reading their materials. So that is us trying to reshape what another social movement believes. And that feels a, a, a little dangerous to me. What I would say, is I understand why it's hard to wrestle with. It's, it's a new idea, right? It's not like we live in a country that has done a lot of work educating the public, right? Around white nationalism uh, and, its, and its origins, right? It's not like we live in a society uh, that opens up conversations around race. So it makes sense that folks haven't spent a lot of time looking at the white nationalist movement uh, in the United States. But um, I would tell folks, you don't have to believe me, right? Uh, pick up a copy of David Duke's My Awakening, right? Listen to Derek Black, uh, who is the former godson of David Duke, right? Who is the son um, of Don, Don Black, who ran the seminal, right? The seminal white nationalist website, White Pride Worldwide, uh, Stormfront, right, was the, is the website uh, for nearly three decades in the United States, right? It was the anchor of the white nationalist movement. Uh, 
listen to what Derek Black says about the role of anti-Semitism. Now you can deny folks who come out of the movement who are telling you that it's anti-Semitism. You can deny folks who have studied the movement, right? Who um, have documented the, how anti-Semitism works at the core, uh, but it's really a historic. Um, what I think folks are worried about is that somehow by acknowledging anti-Semitism, we are somehow uh, de-emphasizing white supremacy and anti-blackness in the United States. It's not true, right? Uh, what we are saying is it is through anti-Semitism, right? That white nationalists express their anti-blackness. To them, they are not seeking to continue a system of exploitation of black people, indigenous people or other people of color. They're looking to remove us from the body politic altogether, not just us, but Jews who they see as the puppet masters of people of color. So what you will understand is that anti-Semitism isn't just a threat to the Jewish community. It's a threat to all people of color. It denies our agency and it denies our legitimate grievances. It creates a conspiracy theory, right? That says that black people have no real legitimate grievances in America that feminists and uh, uh, the LGBT community have no legitimate criti criticisms, that immigrants have no legitimate grievances, that this is merely a war by Jews to enslave and, and dispossess the, the white race in their own language. This is why we have to understand um, that uh, whether we're talking about El Paso, right, where a white nationalist, uh, uh, murdered Latinos in a Walmart, right? Or Dylan Roof, a white nationalist who murdered African-Americans as they worship in a church in Charleston, South Carolina, right? Or uh, uh, the white nationalist who murdered Sikhs, right? In uh, uh, Wisconsin, right? Or Tree of Life or Poe, right? That while there were different targets, right? It was racism that was in play in Charleston and and uh, it was xenophobia in play in El Paso. It was Islamophobia that was used to target Sikhs in Wisconsin, right? It was the hatred of Jews uh, in, in Pittsburgh. But at the core, right, the overarching narrative was the belief, right? These killers believed that they were at, in an existential war with the Jewish community. It's not just Jews who die from anti-Semitism. We also die from it. And in fact, anti-Semitism could prove to be a larger threat against communities of color than it is against the Jewish community itself. And that's why we have to take it seriously. This is not, I'm not saying this is some kumbaya moment, right? I'm not, that's not what I'm about uh, as, as an organizer. That's what I'm about as a human being, right? As an organizer, what I'm telling folks is we have to drop our own conventional wisdom. They are trapping us in false binaries that do not match reality. And when they do not match reality, you do not come up with the right strategies and tools, right, that actually move us towards liberation. And liberation means an inclusive democracy that is people-centered, accountable, and transparent. A society that says it doesn't matter whether you're a 17-year-old or 72-year-old, you know, white veteran, right, in rural Omaha, or a 17-year-old trans Latina, right, in uh, uh, Dallas, Texas, or in New York City, that both and everyone in between has the fundamental right to live, love, worship, and work free from fear and bigotry. That is where we are trying to go in the society. And at the end of the day, unless we also tackle anti-Semitism, right? We will not get there. Or the cost of getting there will be so significant, right? That all of us will be in tatters by the time we arrive. The, there are several questions about um, that, that, that you're, you're looking at, at the role of anti-Semitism in, in white nationalism. Uh, you're, you're seeing anti-Semitism emanating most profoundly from right-wing movements. And there are several audience members who push back on that and feel that um, there are also 
significant forms of anti-Semitism that emanate from the left. And I'm wondering how, whether you agree with that, whether you feel that it's, it's different in, in some way, um, how would you yeah. respond to those concerns? Some, some of the questions indicate that some people feel that, that perhaps even more serious forms of anti-Semitism emanate from, from left-leaning yeah. activists. Yeah, I mean, we can start with the body count, can't we? Um, in America, um, I, I would uh, like folks to acknowledge the number of dead uh, from white nationalism in the United States, um, which over the last, uh, um, uh, in the last uh, three years, um, I believe that number is now in uh, a little bit over a hundred Americans. It, it, it might even be higher than that, but some over a hundred Americans have died from uh, white nationalism and other far right uh, violence in the United States. Uh, there have been, uh, uh, and it has been significant. Um, if we look at the left uh, in the United States, um, there are no physical deaths, um, uh, which tells us that there is something different about the nature of anti-Semitism on the right and left. And I wanna stop folks right now because I'm gonna be a little bit provocative because I know folks are sitting there and saying, well, what about Jersey City and, and, and Brooklyn? And, and folks are mean the black Hebrew Israelites or, or at least sects of black Hebrew Israelites, right? Most sects of the black Hebrew Israelites um, do not engage in, in, in violence against the Jewish community, uh, but there are some sects that, that do. And there are a lot of sects that adopt uh, anti-Semitism. Those aren't movements on the left. Those aren't left-based movements. Those are uh, far-right movements that are, they are authoritarian leaning. Uh, and those in authoritarianism uh, isn't just a problem in white America, right? That is a problem uh, across America. And so uh, to date, at least according to the, to the Department of Justice, unless the Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security um, are lying to us, and I don't believe that they are, uh, there are no documented cases of, of murders of, of Jews um, by the left, by the political left in America. So we can just acknowledge right out the gate that there is something different in terms of, of, um, of, of how anti-Semitism functions on the left and right. There's another distinction before I, I get to anti-Semitism on the left that I think is critically important here, Eric, which is, which is this. Um, Anti-Semitism on the right uh, tends to take uh, two forms. Uh, the first is the racialized anti-Semitism of the, of the white nationalist movement uh, and those that revolve around that. Uh, they don't see Jews, it's not a religious form of bigotry, right? So it's not like anti-Jewish because they are anti-Jewish religion or anti-Jewish culture, right? It is because they see Jews as a racialized other. That means on the far right, anti-Semitism is understood much more as a form of racism, not the racism that black and indigenous folks experience in the United States, uh, but it is a form of racism nonetheless. On, uh, uh, nonetheless. on the left, that racialization of Jews is much less significant. And it's rare that it shows up as written program in left-based organizations. So that tells us that there is something different between anti-Semitism on the left and, and the right. Uh, most of the anti-Semitism that I've observed on, on the left uh, seems to animate around um, discussions around uh, Israel and Palestine. Um, and it tends to revolve around what I call the three antis, right? Uh, folks who are anti-Semitic and uh, folks who believe they are anti-Zionist and folks who see themselves as, as anti-Israel, right? Or anti-government uh, policies in Israel. And uh, what we know is that if one is not conscious of a form of bigotry, that you are more likely to stumble into that bigotry. Um, and so I think we see a lot, of, I at least witness uh, way too often, a lot of crossover into what I would frame uh, as, as anti-Semitism. 
uh, but that anti-Semitism is not driven by, by race. Um, and I do not believe, at least from what I've observed around social movements and my work around anti-Semitism uh, for over 30 years, uh, that there is a comparison then. There. there is not a power comparison uh, in that. Um, and there is not an equivalent of, of violence, right, uh, towards the Jewish community or to other communities that are seen as aligned uh, with the Jewish community. But I think this question may suggest something else. This question, um, if I can, and, and I don't know if this is true, so I hope folks will be uh, gentle with me as, as I try to, to ponder this. I think folks may be asking me, do I think anti-Semitism should be ignored on the left? Uh, and my answer is absolutely not, right? It should absolutely not be ignored uh, on the left. And we don't have to draw false equivalents to make that statement, right? We make that statement because addressing anti-Semitism on the left and in progressive movements make us stronger movements, right? Stronger movements for equality. Uh, it helps us model the spaces we say that we are trying to build uh, in America, which are safe communities where everyone feels welcome, where everyone has opportunity, right? Where, ev where possibilities um, um, exist. That is what we say um, about America, right? We, we are not like, I'm not a pessimist, right? I do this work because I'm an optimist and I recognize what those who came before us right, have accomplished, right? I'm not a person who thinks like I showed up yesterday, right? And, and you know, I'm woke and like all the generations before me were, were unwoke, right? That's, that's a ridiculous piece. So I'm here to say, I agree. I think we have fallen too short around the issue on anti-Semitism within human rights, civil rights and anti-racist uh, spaces. And we need to pick up the pace, right? For all the reasons I laid out, uh, laid out before. We need to be pushed on it. We need to be held accountable. Uh, but at the end of the day, right, the, the difference between anti-Semitism on the right and anti-Semitism on the left has to do both with access to power, right, and where it sits as part of core ideology um, of those movements. And I see big distinctions uh, between that. Uh, but anti-Semitism exists. And you don't often hear me talk about right-wing or left-wing uh, anti-Semitism um, because I don't think that there's left or right anti-Semitism, right? I think there's just anti-Semitism in America and how various social movements tap into it in order to organize power, right? We should remember folks don't adopt forms of bigotry uh, just because it's a great idea. That's not what organizers do. People tap into forms of bigotry right, because they are attempting to build organization um, uh, around it. And so um, I think we have to be uh, alert to that, right? I think we have to be, uh, our job is not to equate ourselves to the white nationalist movement, right? I'm not trying to be on par with them, right? Uh, we should set our standards based off of our own values and based off of our own values. Um, I agree with folks who possibly asked this question uh, that we in the left and human rights space have fallen, um, and I'll use the word deeply short um, on this issue. So since we, we need to wrap up in, in a few minutes, I, I want to sort of combine several people's questions, and it also dovetails with one of the questions I wanted to ask you. There are so many people that want to know, want some guidance on what, what can they do? How does one get started yeah. in this? I think the, especially because we're thinking about things like white privilege and systemic racism that it's very, because, because we have the idea that those, those things are so deeply embedded in, in everyday life, it's hard to, to know exactly you know, how to do the work of starting to dismantle those systems. And I just wanna share a, a, just a couple examples from the questions. One, one person says, uh, they understand how you link anti-Semitism and white nationalism, but um, what do, how do they approach Jewish friends who, who express racist ideas? And, and uh, they say that perhaps it's easier um, just to focus on anti-racist work that, that helps African-Americans 
because some Jews seem to be able to ignore anti, that anti-racist work in favor of fighting anti-Semitism only. Um, another person asks, um, in their synagogue, how do they help their congregants, their, their fellow congregants, differentiate between the BLM movement and the phrase Black Lives Matter? How do I advocate to my synagogue the importance of standing up with the Black community uh, as a civil rights humanitarian issue rather than a political issue. And then another similar question is, um, um, sorry, let me see if I can find it uh, here. What strategies do you have for engaging with people who have not woken to the pervasiveness of white supremacy? As a white Jewish male, I am trying to use my privilege to be an ally in this movement, but I struggle with where to begin when I talk to someone in my orbit talking about reverse racism or looting in the streets. Yeah. Look, um, this is a great way to end. And Eric, just so I'm watching the clock, um, how how quickly do you want me to answer all that? And how much how much time do we have? Well, I just, you know, maybe five minutes. Okay. So let, <laughs> let me move quick then. I'll move quick. So the first thing I, I want to tell folks is um, we should remember something, right? Um, organizing and changing people is, is hard work, right? Uh, it's, it's why um, uh, white nationalists um, uh, rely on, on violence and, and intimidation, right? And, and false propaganda, because they know their principles and their ideas are, are morally bankrupt, right? They're, not going to convince the majority of Americans uh, because none of their ideas actually speak to uh, people's real needs and, and desires and, and, and dreams in the world right now. Um, it is also within, you know, nihilists who have attached themselves to anti-racist and uh, uh, civil rights movements, right? It's, it's easier to kick in the window of a, of a Starbucks than uh, organize people, right? Uh, it is, uh, uh, and we see that all the time and I'm not drawing equivalent, right? There's a difference between breaking a window and the taking of a human life, right? Uh, but neither am I going to ignore, right? That, um, you know, real change takes actually real work. It, it takes maturity, it takes discipline. Uh, it, it takes actually wanting a better world, right? It's not all about rage, right? Um, uh, so it's not all about nihilism. And I think the Black Lives Matters movement, right? And um, the move for Black Lives uh, have, have really expressed that uh, to this country in really deep ways. Um, you have to, uh, so the first thing I would say is start following those folks, even if they make you mad, right? Follow them and listen to, to what folks are saying uh, inside, their, inside those movements. I, I think that that's, critical in, in, in this age of social media, right? For good or ill, that's very easy to do, right? That's, that's very easy to kind of follow. So get a glimpse of, of what's happening. The second thing to remember that I would say is that uh, the modern, right? The present form of anti-Semitism uh, that I believe at least is, is most of threat uh, to all of us in the United States and to American democracy came as a direct result of the victory of the civil rights movement, right? This form of anti-Semitism that we contend with today was the response, right, to the legal defense, the legal defeat of, of white nationalism, right? The placing of white nationalism on, the, on a contested terrain, right? So I'm not making unicorns and rainbows. What I'm saying is, is it made the fight to end white supremacy very, very real and very, very attainable. Um, we need to understand, right, that the response to that was the reemergence of a new form of anti-Semitism in America, a dominant form of anti-Semitism. That means anti-Semitism, as, as another friend often says, is inherently anti-Black, right? And that means one of the ways we fight anti-Semitism in modern day America is by also fighting anti-Blackness in America. So there is a direct relationship uh, between the Black and Jewish communities in this moment. Our, our destinies, right, and America's destiny 
is intertwined. Will we have an inclusive democracy or will we have an authoritarian society, right? It's not about left or right, Democrat or Republican, conservative or liberal. This is about inclusion versus exclusion. And most of us, right? Most of us in America, over two thirds of America, value that inclusive, intimate democracy. And so what does that mean uh, for those in the Jewish community? I, I would say this. The first is you have to understand white nationalism, right? There are lots of organizations out there doing work around uh, helping uh, folks inside and outside the Jewish community understand white nationalism, right? Southern Poverty Law Center, Bend the Ark, Highlander, Anti-Defamation League, Muslim um, advocates, political research associates. There are a host of huge number of organizations who have done work, spend some time uh, attending one of their talks, deepen your knowledge around, anti, around white nationalism. And you need to make the case to the Jewish community, like I did tonight, why it is much more of a danger right now. It doesn't mean you ignore everything else, but you understand where the real danger lies uh, right now. The next thing I would just say really quickly, Eric, is, uh, is this, you know, <laughs> yes, folks aren't gonna wanna talk to you about white nationalism. You're coming in and you're talking to them about something dangerous, right? In a moment where folks are under tremendous stress, global pandemic, record unemployment, right? Climate change disasters, right? Political violence. Yes, this is not the time where folks are gonna be excited to sit down and talk to you about more danger. So you, you have to approach it, right, by through conversation, right, and kind of hearing what people's concerns are first, right? You can't be the first to talk uh, in these conversations. And so, you know, one of the things I, I would point out is um, a, a group like People's Action, who is doing phenomenal work around how to have deep conversations, right? And, uh, you know, you should check out notes around how to train for, for real conversations if you're seeking to move institutions. Um, in moving those institutions, I, I would just say this. Uh, if you're in the Jewish community, you're trying to move the Jewish community or trying to move folks outside the Jewish community, you cannot think of yourself as an ally to, to Black Lives Matter. You have to get to a point where you understand you have your own skin in the game. And I'll, and I'll end with this, right? Because it brings me back now to, to, uh, to Janice Rothschild, um, Blumberg and uh, Jacob uh, Rothschild. Um, and I think about their work in the 60s and the work of everyone else. And um, we have to remember, right? When the civil rights movement came knocking, they weren't received with open arms. When the LGBTQ community came knocking at the door of the civil rights movement, they were not received with open arms. When Blacks approached labor in the 40s, right? We were not received with open arms. That's just not how change works, right? You were usually received first with rejection, right? Then you were received with resistance. But this is your home. This is your movement, right? This is the 21st century civil rights movement. And you have every right to be in this movement as well. Um, you have a home here. And it is okay to talk about anti-Semitism, right? Uh, what we are doing in, you know, I won't speak for Black Lives Matters, what I'll say is as someone who sees himself as part of Black Lives Matters, what I will say is that those are the conversations that are happening inside this movement right now. Um, they just are happening without you and without those you are talking to. So I say, bring folks along and Maybe this will help as I think about the Rothschilds right now. When I was a little kid, Eric, you know, I grew up poor, you know, I grew up poor most of, of my life. And, um, you know, by the time August rolled around in summer, right, we, we were out of things to do in hot summer in Southern California. And so we were mainly like, we were latchkey kids. So we mainly found ourselves sitting outside and we would play this game that I've talked about before called If I Were. And If I Were was like, if I were in the midst of a, of a cage at the zoo and the lion got in, here's what I would do. And we'd argue as kids about what we would or wouldn't do, right? 
and um, or if we were going down the freeway at high speed and the brakes went out, here's what we would do. But the one question we would always ask is, if we were in the midst of the civil rights movement in the 1960s, here's what we would do. And we would argue about what we would or wouldn't do, right? We were kids full of bravado about what we would or wouldn't put up with. We didn't understand Jim Crow, right? We didn't understand the racial segregation, right? That our parents had to endure, right? So we were fully confident about what we would and, and, and wouldn't tolerate. And we'd argue for, for hours about that. But that question has always haunted me. I often, uh, uh, for years and years and years and years, I would just reflect often on what would I have done in the midst of the 1960s civil rights movement? Would I have stood up? Would I have stood next to my neighbors? Would I have actually stood up for my country, right? For it's like highest aspirations, right? Would I have recognized, right? That the democracy that does exist in America is largely because black people have fought and died for that democracy. They and others who have, who have joined them. Like, is that what I would have done in that moment, right? Or would I have sat back, right? And criticized from a distance, right? Criticized without any, all putting forth any alternatives criticized with, with, uh, uh, with a cynicism, right? I've, I've always wondered, like, would I, have, would I have owned my moment in history? Well, here's what I realized three, three years ago, and um, uh, this is what I, everyone can realize right now. We don't have to answer that. We don't have to answer that question anymore. We don't have to wonder what we would have done. Uh, the truth is, is that it's happening around us right now, right? And whatever we would have done, in the 1960s civil rights movement is exactly what we are going to do when we get off this uh, 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 presentation today. And I tell folks to make it count, right? Make this moment count. History will judge you for what you do and don't do in this moment. This is a time, right? Where what it means to be an American and what will America look like is being fully debated around society. This is not the time to be a monk, right? This is not the time to lean out. This is the time to lean in. And that means uncomfortability, right? That means being part of institutions that aren't perfect, but are at least trying to lean, right, towards justice. Uh, that means putting your values over your political ideology. We are in a, we are in a, we are in a country that has become addicted right, to political ideology, which by its very nature, right, is contradictory. Uh, we need to lean into our values. Our values are what guides us forward together from one age to the other. So let's sharpen up our pencils, right? The future is unwritten uh, and we are honored, right? We should all feel honored to be part of a generation that gets the right, the beginning of a new age. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. I'm, I hope we have many more conversations in the future, uh, but it's been a one, wonderful to host you here uh, with, with our Emory audience. Uh, and thank you very much for being with us. Thank you everyone in the audience for attending. Uh, and uh, please uh, follow our events uh, on js.emory.edu. Have a good night. Thank you, everyone.